You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Bitcoin, Ether, Ripple, Litecoin, and more. Cryptocurrencies and other digital assets are taking the financial world by storm. This exploding market provides everything a savvy trader needs. Volatility, volume, and liquidity. Provided you know how to find it. That's where we come in. Welcome to the Crypto Rundown. Each week, we'll break down the latest trading activity, trends, and developments on everything from coins to tokens, futures, and even OTC options. If it's moving the crypto markets, then you'll find it on the Crypto Rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional-grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL Analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit gvol.io. That's G-V-O-L dot I-O. Now it's time to dive into the exploding world of cryptocurrencies and digital assets. It's time for the Crypto Rundown. All right, everybody. That music means it is time once again for the Crypto Rundown, the program here on the Options Insider Radio Network, where we venture beyond the boundaries of the traditional world of your Apple and your Tesla and your VIX and your SPY options. And we look a little bit further afield. See what's going on over there in them of our crypto hills. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting aforementioned network. Remember, if you folks want to get at us live, especially if you have an awesome pro Q&A session coming at you tomorrow with really a, a, a well-known name in the option space, the original market wizard for the option space, the only options trader featured in that original market wizards book. You folks know what I'm talking about. Get at them over there on our pro Q&A session tomorrow, the place you can guys can do that and get access to all the other great exclusive pro content we do over here at theoptionsinsider.com. Slash pro is the place to go to learn more. And of course, however you get at us live after the fact, make sure you keep those questions and comments coming. We do have to hear from all of you guys and gals out there. And let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. I'm pleased to be joined once again in the old crypto hot seat by Mr. Eric Kovalak, the managing partner over there. At Vellum Capital, Eric, welcome back to the Crypto Rundown program. Hey, Mark. Thanks. Good to be with you. And, Eric, you have good timing. You tend to come on the show whenever there are things happening. So maybe we need to just book you like clockwork because whenever you come on, something fun pops off in the market, sir. Yes, it's the old adage. They love you. They think you're a genius when the, when your uh, when your fund goes up, and you're an idiot when it goes down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, timing is everything, right? And the timing yeah. here is good. So let's get to it. A lot to unpack. It is time for the Bitcoin breakdown. It's time to explore the latest trending activity, trends, and developments across the world's leading crypto market. It's time for the, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin breakdown. breakdown. All right, everybody, let's get to it. It is time to break down the world's leading digital asset. Yep, I'm talking about the big dog, Bitcoin, a little bit bigger (laughs) than it was even on our last show. On our last show, we had a nice rally. We were trading right around 57,500 at the end of the show there. But we are a wee bit north of that today. Coming at the start of the show, we are a little bit north, a tick north of the 62,000 level. So, yes, listeners, we broke through 60K 
and kept on rallying all the way up to 62, almost 63,000 out there in the big dog Bitcoin. It puts us up about 4,500 handles from where we were this time last week. Of course, had quite the range. You got down to about 54,000 as well. It's talking over 8,000 point range just in the course of the past week. So a lot to unpack there. Uh, but, you know, actually, we'll, we'll, we have the big dog, the elephant in the room. We'll get to that in a second. But first, Eric, it's been a little bit since you joined us. It was back in mid-July, kind of the doldrums of the crypto world back there in July when there wasn't a ton of volume hitting the tape, wasn't a ton going on out there. Obviously, a lot has changed since then, not the least of which the price action. So let's start there. What are your thoughts on this just this rampant move to the upside we've seen, particularly over the last few weeks out there in Bitcoin, sir? Yep, sure. So in July, we had just experienced this pretty nasty sell-off in April and May and late spring. Uh, the number of different reasons that happened, um, but they were all kind of looking for some stability in the market and looking for the middle part of the market to catch some interest. Um, that's happened over the course of the summer going into the fall. For whatever reason, um, it's not just the fund managers in the crypto space, but I think traders too they're all kind of targeting year end numbers and they're trying to use the end of the year as some sort of um, indication of the overall strength and, and the competitive nature of, of digital assets versus equities and some of the other markets that tend to ramp going into the Santa Claus rally. So I think people started pointing upwards towards end summer. And, you know, last couple of weeks have been really pretty fascinating to watch uh, on two reasons. Uh, primarily the whole market's gone up quite a bit. I think it's another relapse possibly of the inflation narrative. Uh, but also too, I think during this period, we had VIX play around in the 25s, uh, 24s, 25s for, for two cycles. I think there were real concerns coming out of Asia um, and some of the, the different uh, implosions of that real estate fund over in China. And there was a number of potential risk factors on the horizon, not to mention the one that I think really was the underlying factor for most of the market, and that's the interest rate shifts. And so the somewhat of a surprise aggression in, in, in raising interest rates higher than people or faster than people expected, with more confidence than people expected, a lot of... Um, a lot of factors of risk, including the supply chain interruptions, they're all kind of leading the the overall equity market to being a little nervous, really, until uh, we just got these consumer numbers out that are starting to look quite positive in the last few days here. So until we saw the VIX drop off um, in the last week back down into 16, 17 range, I think I even saw a 15 print on the VIX cash. I think equity markets were a bit nervous and that kept crypto markets kind of nervous. So in the last two weeks, we've seen cryptos really ramp in a big way. Um, interestingly, though, a lot of that has been focused towards uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. And that's a feature probably both of the ETFs that are coming out, but more so just a general sense of people's willingness to uh, take on risk. So even though prices are a lot higher right now, uh, the underlying metrics in the market I'm seeing are um, kind of a yellow light, not not necessarily a green light yet. We're, we're still trying to navigate this a little bit. I think we all are trying to navigate these crazy waters out there. You touched on the big story. We can't bury the lead any farther here, Eric, because... The moment that we have all been waiting for is finally here. Or is it? <laughs> yes, you know, since we launched this show, even before then, since back when the futures launched, and even probably before that, people have been speculating on the launch of a potential Bitcoin ETF. This was seen by many as the watershed moment. This is what would transform crypto from a still somewhat you know obscure portion of the marketplace, even though it has grown leaps and bounds since the days in the futures first launched, but still somewhat a, a niche marketplace. This would transform it, some thought, overnight into a big boy, mature marketplace. We'd see volumes explode. We'd see the mainstream folks that are maybe a little bit reticent on going over to a venue like a Coinbase or others and trying to buy spot crypto. Uh, they would be more comfortable trading something that could go into their existing securities account. It would drive volumes into the other venues. It would be just this great virtuous cycle, this rising tide that would lift all boats. Well, fast forward to this week, and that moment is effectively here, but with a lot of caveats attached. Yes, we are all eagerly awaiting the launch of the first Bitcoin ETF to come out. It was the ProShares Bitcoin Strategy ETF. It is scheduled to begin trading 
tomorrow. However, there are a couple of caveats baked in there. First off, this is not what a lot of people in the crypto space have been waiting for, something that effectively holds the actual (laughs) spot Bitcoin. That is not this. This ETF is effectively going to hold the Bitcoin futures that trade over there at CME. Now, we talked about those many times on the show. We do it pretty much every week. And they're, as you said, a large institutionally oriented product. But for the purposes of this, for an area where the regulation is still fluid for the SEC, really, that is still, I think it's fair to say, a little bit skeptical on the overall crypto space. This, to me, seems like the most sensible way to proceed. And that's clearly why they went this way. All the other proposals that are out there for pure as they call them, pure play Bitcoin ETFs, all of those are kind of held up in the weeds because the SEC is a little bit concerned about their oversight on those other platforms. On the futures and the listed exchanges here in the U.S., then we can see a little bit more of the regulators actually having some control. So I think to me, this surprised a lot of people. It didn't surprise me that the first overall ETF is going to be something based on the lit and listed markets out there. Now, some folks are are concerned that, hey, you know, that the spot market is going to easily overwhelm the Bitcoin futures market because the volume is so, so much larger in one than it is on the other. So they think this is maybe a recipe for disaster. This potential ETF could be manipulated. And uh, some interesting data coming out here. This was a study out of Bitwise Asset Management, and they looked at the, uh, the CME Bitcoin futures market versus the spot And they found that the futures markets were the, quote, leading source of price discovery in the Bitcoin market worldwide. They said prices move first on CME ahead of Coinbase, Kraken, and other offshore exchanges. To them, the CME is the big dog. The spot market does not wag the futures tail. So a lot of interesting stuff to get to. But let's start, Eric, kind of the the elephant in the room. What are your thoughts on this proposed ETF? I should put out there, too, nothing is official until this thing lists. Uh, the SEC could come in at the last minute and say, uh, no, 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 you cannot, you cannot list this thing. So they still have an objection period. I believe it's till midnight tonight, something along those lines. So we could, after all this talks, not see this thing go live tomorrow. But Eric, what are your thoughts on this ETF in general? The fact that it's a futures oriented versus more of a pure spot oriented type product. And then C, what are your thoughts on, on the impact of this going forward? Yeah, I can imagine the run on stops we'll have at 11.59 tonight. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> yes, thanks, it's going to be an interesting time. <laughs> well, well, listen, you know, the Winklevoss twins, they've been at this game since 2013, and and for good reason. I mean, whenever you have a very difficult to, to administrate um, asset that is, you know, potentially really lucrative to invest in, it, it helps to have intermediaries that can allow you to access the asset more easily. And ETF's a, a brilliant idea uh, in that regard. Um, you know, they've been working on it for eight, nine years, put a lot of money into it, a lot of legal cases. And as we find out today, you know, it's going to look a lot more like the various VIX products where you have futures being held. They're going to have to roll them in some way. And I think the real question for investors is, is the headwind of that future roll worth the ease of access? You know, I'm looking at the, the futures compilation, you know, right now, and there's a good four or $500 a month in premium that you're going to lose. Now, is that's not a tremendous amount compared to VIX, but compared to say gold or some of these more mature assets, that's that's quite a headwind. Um, I think that'll probably close up once the uh, ETF opens. Uh, what's there's two things that I'm really enthusiastic about. One, uh, this is going to force, and this says, this has nothing to do with retail investors, but it's going to force uh, bigger pipes between institutions and the futures market and the cash market. So uh, people who are crossing the asset class, who are bringing money back and forth as their market making or balancing two sides of the book, they're going to have to normalize those pipes. It's going to make the futures a really efficient vehicle. Um, I could actually see more people trading futures because of the existence of the ETF. And I think, too, it's going to normalize a lot of the banking ecosystem between you know investment houses, hedge funds, trading institutions and organizations, over the counter desk, all this kind of stuff. It's just going to be one more part of the spider web that makes it stronger, a stronger um, overall ecosystem. And that's going to be good. And I think um, you know, it gives regulators a chance to view that, see it as a responsible way of having trade and commerce, and it will um, lessen the burden of further regulation and allow more people to participate in the market. So that's good. For investors, is it a suitable alternative? Well, I mean, it does provide some solutions for 
um, advisors to easily access direct currencies. I'm not so sure that a lot of advisors are necessarily uh, being asked to um, invest directly in Bitcoin or necessarily just Bitcoin. I'm hearing from a lot of advisors that their clients are saying, hey, I want to participate in this cryptocurrency thing um, or a basket or, or different um, ways of having the asset class that's you know actively managed to try to ameliorate some of the risk. I think um, you know having a product where you know that you're going to lose I don't know, uh, as much as 10% a year in premium burn isn't necessarily a great way. I think the, the asset growth is going to overcome that. So you'll, you'll still be out net ahead, but you know, five years of that and you've given up quite a, a number. So that's something for, for investors to consider. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack about this. By the way, listeners, if you're listening live or maybe immediately, actually, this will probably be dead by the time the show's over, but it's a flash poll, quick flash poll for you folks over there now at options is the place to play along. Just a simple question. Do you plan to trade the new Bitcoin ETF? Yes, no, or you're not sure yet? Gave you a little bit of an out. Our producers are nice to you today. Uh, so far right now, early voting, 60% saying yes, 20% saying no, 20% saying you're not sure yet. This will be live throughout the end of the show. So if you're listening after the fact, sorry, you missed the boat on this one here. But, you know, Eric, I was kind of surprised at, at some of the pushback we saw to this ETF, because as I mentioned earlier, it seemed to me this was really the only logical way to proceed was to create something around an already regulated and listed product and then kind of go from there. The notion that we could have this pure ETF just holding the spot out there on all these unregulated venues seemed to me a little bit naive. So I was kind of surprised at the degree of shock there was that, oh my God, they're going with the futures first. Is is this kind of the the vector you expected them to take as well? This seemed like, to me, the past of least resistance from a regulatory perspective. Was that your thought as well? Did you expect a futures-oriented product or were you surprised that they didn't go the, the quote-unquote pure play route? No, no I, this is what I expected. I, I think the, the the volatility markets created the model, and, and they're doing a good job of, of maintaining it. It's a it's a great market for traders. The volatility market is, uh, and so I think that this is no surprise to see this this way. Um, I, I think that you know whatever whatever has the easiest regulatory burden is going to get to market first. Yes, it's very much a, a regulatory driven marketplace at this point, and that we're seeing that play out. And now, in fact. You kind of touched on the drag there a couple of times, Eric. Let's just get to this now. I was going to save it for the crypto questions, but we have a few questions on this. First off, we have a question here from Backtrack. He says, hey, Crypto Rundown, love the show. Thanks for being the only guy out there talking about the derivative side of the market. Well, you're welcome there, Mr. or Mrs. Backtrack. He says, my question, you always talk about the drag of negative roll yield on ETFs that try to replicate futures positions. Do we expect the same negative roll yield effect that we see in USO or VXX? To play out in this new Bitcoin ETF, we have a similar question coming in from our live chat. Uh, Nickel says he's concerned about the drag on the new Bitcoin ETF. Uh, Should he be? Really quickly, uh, Eric, we have some people come to the show all the time who are not as versed in the world of derivatives. So maybe really quickly, let's start at the top. Explain what the heck we mean. Let's let's try to do it in as simple of a terms as possible (laughs) in terms of roll yield and Katango and all that fun. And then B, you kind of laid it out somewhere around 10%. Uh, what are your thoughts on the impact of that drag? And should our should the traders out there should they be maybe a little bit reticent to put their money into this because of that? Yeah, sure. So the the premise of the ETF, and this is the big sticking point for regulators, is that if you own uh if you own a share of the ETF, therefore the ETF has to own something. And right now, regulators aren't certain that Bitcoin is actually a thing. <laughs> they're not sure you can actually own it, so to speak. And I know that may sound silly or not, but in terms of, of terms of all the regulations that have been built since 1930 that help organize our financial markets, our traditional fan- financial markets, the cryptocurrency digital asset class still doesn't necessarily have legal standing. And uh, without going into all that complexity, if the ETF is going to own something, it has to be able to account for its value and do the accounting on it. So instead of owning Bitcoin specifically, it's going to own futures. Well, the way futures work is that if you want to own the rights to something today that gets delivered 30 days in advance from now and you want to lock in those rights, there's a bit of interest 
carry on that right. There's a bit of um, premium, so to speak. And that accounts for many things from time value of money to the volatility in the market, to the availability of the assets, to the cost of delivery. Um, some of these are very insignificant when it comes to something that's a cash product like Bitcoin. But if it were oil, those would all be part of the cost for premium. And as the ETF buys a future, that future slowly every single day marches closer to expiration when that delivery becomes due. So the ETF has to roll that future ahead in time. And what it ends up doing is owning an average of futures. So let's say it has an average 30-day future. That means when the future gets 15 days to expiration, it rolls it ahead to the 45-day. Then it holds it to 15, then it rolls it ahead to 45 days. And they'll be doing this every single day. But the problem for long-term investors is it means that they are constantly buying futures with more premium than they're selling them for. And that says nothing about the fluctuations in the spot price of the market. But what it means is that they're paying in just a little bit of premium every single day for the right to own the potential for delivery on something at some point in the future. Those future prices are added up at the end of the day. They're settled. And that's what creates the ETF and its price to market. It allows regulators to point to the ETF. And if the ETF ever had a collapse or some sort of a breakdown, they could say, okay, whatever you own now has to be divided up amongst the shareholders and distributed to them. Well, it owns futures, and that's how it will understand its value. They can't decide if owning Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of these other digital assets is a real thing and how they would actually take uh, control of those assets. So it's a major problem. That's why they're using the futures market. For investors, they have to decide if I'm going long something, uh, is that current premium role worth the the um, the potential upside in that underlying asset in the ETF? Now, it's not always necessarily a negative premium role. Sometimes it can go into backwardation or when there's instances where people believe that the future prices in that asset are going to be lower than today's prices and you'll actually get paid a slight bit to uh, to own the asset. Um, you know, options traders remember the the once very popular product XIV which was paid every single month to own or to sell short a volatility premium. So there could be instances, and we've seen these a few times in the Bitcoin and the crypto markets where, uh, for whatever reason, um, the forward month future was priced above the 60 or 90 or 120 day. And that's just a function of, of uh, the structure of the market, of expectations, volatility, risk, all these kind of uh, factors. Uh, but the normative position of futures markets is contango, where you do pay that premium. And of course, listeners, if any of that went over your head, check out some of our educational programs on the Network Options Bootcamp, Options Playbook Radio. On the Futures side, you may want to check out our This Week in Futures Options program. Not a straight educational show, but we do touch on those topics there like a contango. We'll get into that in volatility views as well because that plays out in a lot of the volatility products out there like the aforementioned VXX out there. Now, Eric, I haven't had a chance to, to dive into the prospectus on this ETF. Maybe it sounds like you have already how are they structuring this like obviously the approach will dictate a lot of how much of drag we're getting you know we saw last you know back when the oil markets inverted we saw uso completely change its approach and get away from a more front contract type approach which tracks the underlying a lot better but of course also suffers dramatically from that roll yield and they kind of pushed their futures exposure a lot farther out the curve it made it much more resilient to the shocks in the marketplace, but also doesn't track as well. There's there's kind of payoffs and trade-offs for everything you do. You know, the farther off you go down the curb, the less you suffer from that roll yield, but also the tracking is is also a little bit of a problem there. So you, you can go a basket of different maturities. There's a lot of different approaches. How are they approaching that from this new ETF perspective? Uh, you know, I don't know specifically this one, Mark, because there's a number of ETFs that are in the hopper right now. This just happens to be the first one out the door. Um, I do think they're using a 30-day average. Um, it might be a 90-day. I'd have to I'd have to look. But if you look across the, the Bitcoin futures curve, you really don't get a more efficient position on carrying until you're about 180 days out. So it's a pretty steep curve, and it maintains that, which makes sense for a highly volatile market. Yeah, so you definitely need to take a judicious approach. This is something to be... To be cautious of listeners when you go diving in, oh, this is this is amazing, this new Bitcoin ETF. And certainly this is a or a, it has the potential to be. It's not a done deal yet. Obviously, you have to wait for the final approval, but it has the potential to be a, a watershed moment, just like the launch of the futures were. Of course, that ended up ushering in the crypto winter. So <laughs> I don't think this is going to have the same effect, but still interesting. Nonetheless, certainly a big one to watch. And it's had a lot of impacts on the marketplace. You could certainly say that 
a lot of the run-up we've seen of late has been in just the anticipation and the lead-up, the build-up to the launch of this ETF. So this had a lot of impact on the overall space. Remember, all the analytics are going to break down here, coming at you courtesy of our friends over there at Genesis Volatility Gvol.io is a place to go to kick the tires and light the fires out there. If you did so, you would see a vol coming into today's show. It's had some interesting movements since our last show. On our last show, it was at about an 81%. Remember, this is kind of like an average at the money vol across the active term structure out there. Uh, coming into today's show is at about 88%. So it has ticked up. And we saw a spike last Friday. Last Friday was kind of the hot day. A lot of volume, a lot of paper, a lot of speculation, frenzy around uh, the ETF and everything else. Uh, that drove vol up to about 105%. It's been a little while since we've seen uh, Bitcoin vol really hang out in the triple digits range. And it didn't hang out there for long. That's another feature, really, of Bitcoin vol these days. Very similar to uh, precious metals vol in that it can get a nice spike to it. But it's very short-lived, and it comes back down to a range it was trading in before. And in this case, we're back into the 80% odd range right now. A bit vol, our friend Simon Ho's uh, product out there, his Bitcoin VIX, will be on the show coming up soon. Listeners talk about his newest launch. That's at about a 90%. So that's coming a little bit. It was 92% on our show last week. And in terms of the skew, what's going on from the 30 to 20 delta skew range out there? Again, if those terms confuse you check out our educational programming on the network that that has seen a little bit of evolution even though we did see some big swings between our last show and now on our last show it was about a positive one and a half it swung all the way in another direction got down to negative 6.1 back on friday as well and coming into today's show has swung back the other way back up to about a two and a half uh we're seeing that similar stuff remember simon and his team also have that bit skew coming out soon so We get more into that. That has dropped. It was about a 91 on our last show and about a 90.6 coming into today's show. In terms of the action we're seeing out there, we are seeing a lot of action out there in the Bitcoin options as, again, this future, I should say this ETF is really driving a lot of interest out there. And we're seeing that reflected in the volume and indeed the OI coming into the start of the show out there on Deribit, which is still the big dog. We have the OI on the calls up to about 138,000. That's up about 22,000 contracts. And this time last week, uh, the puts going up there as well, still pretty much half of what the calls are. The puts are up to about 65,000, so up about 9,000 contracts from this time last week. In terms of where the action is, where the size positions are in Bitcoin options, it's still December leading the dance, up to 78,000 contracts open. That's up about 7,000 contracts from this time last week. Number two is October. It's closing in, but it's not going to have enough time, I don't think, to replace or usurp December at the top of the list. Uh, October's up to about 45,000 contracts, opens up about 8,000. And then bringing up the rear, we have the weekly expiring on the 22nd in October <laughs> with about 25,000. That's a newcomer. Seems to have knocked March out of the top three there. In terms of the volume, how much notional value? Again, you know, I'm a, not a huge fan of the notional value moniker or the notional value measure. But again, that's how it's thrown around in the crypto world. So we'll continue on that front. On our last show, the overall notional value of that OI on the options front on Deribit was about $9 billion, about $10 billion if you added in all the other venues. That has swollen to about $12 billion now on Deribit and thirteen and a quarter billion or so if you add in all the other venues. Obviously, we have seen a lot of paper. We've also seen the price go up as well. So that combo has managed to help uh, increase that overall notional value of that OI. And in terms of action, how much paper did we see? We saw what could have been... The busiest day potentially ever out there in terms of the options on Deribit. We have seen, you know, $1 billion days multiple times. We saw them not too long ago. We have seen $2 billion days. The most recently we saw those was back in April, April 22nd and 23rd. We saw back to back $2 billion days. I'm hard pressed to think of a $3 billion day, let alone a $3.3 billion day. Yeah, that's exactly what we saw on Deribit last Friday, the 15th. $3.3 billion with the B worth of notional value going up out there on Deribit. That's a huge explosion of value and a, a far cry from what we saw in the midsummer when we were seeing a couple hundred million there, a couple hundred million. We had weeks of the busiest day. I think near your last show, Eric, in July, the busiest day was 368 million. So. <laughs> a 10x change <laughs> from your last appearance. Does any of these numbers surprise you, Eric, in terms of the groundswell of volume and the spike in vol and then coming off as we're leading into the launch of this ETF, Eric? 
No, I, I think that once this market gets going for derivatives, it's, it's going to be massive. I think it's just going to be unbelievably huge. I think it's going to um, lead to all sorts of new uh, structuring opportunities for traders. So um, I'm really pleased to see that. Well, we're obviously big fans of the crypto derivatives here as well. So <laughs> hopefully this ETF will will kick off a entirely new wave of trading in these products. Speaking of trading, let's look at the options, see what the size positions are from a strike perspective. What are the big open positions right now in Bitcoin options over there on Deribit? And as you said, we've rallied through the 60,000 strikes since our last show. Uh, the par strike, the 100,000 strike, seems like it has maintained a death grip on all of your all of your imaginations out there. That continues this week. There are 15,000 contracts open now on the 100,000 strike in Bitcoin. That's up about 2,000 contracts in this time last week. Number two, a still optimistic, even though it doesn't sound as outlandish this week as it did last week or two weeks ago. <laughs> the 70,000 strike, number two, with 14,000 contracts open. It's up about 3,000 from this time last week. Number three, the 60K strike, the now at the money. 60K strike with about 12,000 contracts opens up about 2,000 from last week. Number four, the 80,000 strike. So we're kind of splitting the difference between 60 and 100,000 there with 10,000 contracts open up nearly 1,000 from this time last week. And number five, a newcomer to our top five. If 100K wasn't enough for you, didn't get your blood pumping enough listeners, how about 120,000? That is the number five size open position in Bitcoin options right now with 9,200 contracts open on that strike. So folks are are looking at naught but upside when it comes to the crypto options, even though, like I said, that's just OI. Obviously, there's a lot of selling activity on those as well. You go to venues like LedgerX and others, a lot of covered calls going up on these strikes. And they're certainly hard to argue with those trades. There's a lot of juice <laughs> in those strikes. We were talking earlier about this new ETF that's going to obviously trade on the Bitcoin futures at CME, that has obviously driven a lot of interest in all things CME crypto right now. We saw pretty much the biggest day ever for the options on Friday, nearly 200 contracts. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, but again, it's a 5X contract. So you're talking pure Bitcoin exposure perspective, a thousand coins, quote unquote, up on that. The OI also growing up a couple hundred contracts to nearly 1,200. That's a lot for those products that have kind of struggled to find their footing. The futures. Also getting a nice uptick out there. Uh, they put up about 14,000 contracts on Friday on this big action-packed day. The OI has also increased to about 11,600. Uh, Some venues like Coindesk and other looking at the notional value of that OI are saying that CME is at the, uh, the a record level of OI. They look at it at about $3.64 billion. I'm not sure. These are This is just the futures because they also talk about number of outstanding contracts at CME being it's 56,400 contracts. I think obviously they're adding in, I think everything there across the board, uh, because we talked about the OI, the futures is a lot less than that. The OI is up not even 12,000 out there, but still we're looking at or near all time highs for a lot of the different uh, levels out there from an OI perspective at CME. They also broke down there, uh, the spread between the front month future and the spots has jumped quite a bit. <laughs> over the last few months, it was about 1% premium annualized. That's over 16%. That has followed along, obviously, with the rally. That gets back to what Eric was talking about earlier about the drag going on out there. It'll be interesting to see how all this plays out when and if the ETF does launch and how that impacts these spreads going forward. And also, for a lot of you out there who are watching the micro products, those continue to grow as well. The OI is up to nearly 60,000 on the micro Bitcoin front. Uh, that's a big swing. That's up about 12,000 from this time last week. They did nearly 30,000 contracts on Friday. So a pretty active day across the board on all things CME out there. Eric, has this, I know when we talked in the past, you weren't a huge watcher of the, of the CME products. Has this, this new impending launch of this ETF, has this maybe caused you to pay more attention to the futures and everything going on over there at CME from a crypto perspective? Yeah, well, I am going to be watching very closely for the near term because the ETF announcement certainly has been so far to buy the rumor, sell the news. And so we'll be looking at things such as that front month premium 
uh, you could get some really unusual feedback loops going um, in the first uh, you know couple months of this product. For example, if the product turns out to be popular and it has to buy futures at, in mass, uh, is that going to force the premiums up, which is actually bad for the product, but it makes the premiums go higher and the volumes go higher on the futures. So y- you could get some really weird feedback loops that will exist for a short period of time. Probably going to be some trading opportunities in that mix. Um, we'll just wait and see. You know, we'll follow the volumes of the uh, ETF pretty closely to the change of volumes of the futures. That's the big question. How will this ETF, if it is approved and launched, how will that impact the futures? Obviously, it will drive a lot of paper. <laughs> how that will materialize is the big question. As we keep on rolling, it is time to explore the altcoin universe. It's time to move beyond Bitcoin and find out what's moving the rest of the crypto marketplace. It's time to boldly venture into the altcoin universe all right listeners welcome to the altcoin universe it's not all bitcoin on the show this week it's just mostly bitcoin (laughs) and we are going to touch on it again here as you break down the top 10 here kind of hard to escape uh, the big dog out there let's look at a quick top 10 over there from a Market cap perspective, number 10, USD coin at about 32, almost 33 billion worth of market cap. Number nine, good old Doge. (laughs) What more can I say about Doge? It hasn't already been said out there. You love it or you hate it. It's very polarizing either way. Uh, 33 and a half billion worth of market cap for Doge. Number eight, Polkadot, 40 billion, almost exactly. Number seven, Solana, the on again, off again, has had quite the run over the last few months. Gave some of that up. Now it's coming back on again at about 46.8 billion out there. Number six, XRP, right around the 51 billion level. Number five, Tether, at about 69 billion out there. Number four, Cardano, 69 billion as well, almost 70 billion for Cardano. Number three, Binance Coin, 80 billion. That means number two, is ETH 441 billion and number one, the big dog Bitcoin holding firm north of the one T, the one trillion level at nearly 1.2 trillion worth of market cap. I know for a lot of you, you're very intrigued about what's going on on the ETH side of the fence. How will this new ETF, will this perhaps lead to eventual offerings for ETH out there? After all, there is an ETH futures market at CME, not quite as active or vibrant, doesn't have the history that the Bitcoin futures do, but it does exist and the possibility for perhaps down the road, a similar offering on the ETH front. Coming into today's show, ETH is up not quite 200 handles, about 188 handles. It flirted with the 4,000 level in between our shows, got up about 39.65 and to the dark side at about 3,400. So about a 600 handle range between our last show and now. Eric, I know you spend most of your time watching the big dog out there, which is Bitcoin, but what are your thoughts on The number two product from a market cap perspective, I know for a lot of our listeners, it is number one in their hearts, sir. What are you thinking about ETH out there these days? Uh, Generally very positive on ETH. The good thing about buying ETH is that you capture a whole basket of layer one and layer two uh, cryptocurrencies and digital assets. So just, just to help clarify, layer one are the digital assets or cryptocurrencies that describe, you know, the underlying main blockchain architecture. Layer two, are all the cool things like the operating systems that we build to go on top of the blockchain architecture. So uh, layer two is is, um, is probably where we're going to see a lot of added value come into the market. So I'm starting to pay a lot of attention uh, to those layer two and, and what we call the altcoins, which are the, say, 50 billion to 5 billion space, you know, the next 20 down the list. Um, so there's something interesting going on right now as far as how the whole market is pricing and reacting. Um, we have over the past say 12 months had a tremendous amount of development go on in the alt space. These projects are starting to show maturity. They're starting to show relevance, um, technical progress and advancements. Um, And that's all somewhat in many ways, just kind of been inventoried by the market, Uh, you know? And so it, it kind of begs the question, should we be investing on a fundamental basis because all of these projects are um, forward value in the market space, or should we be investing more on, on a, a, a crowd effect basis? And I think the way we're seeing things priced right now, I'm starting to lean into the crowd effect. We know that there is a fundamental um, arrival of all sorts of new technologies in this space. They're all very interesting, potentially very fruitful. The problem is, is they're not pricing with a huge amount of enthusiasm right now. And so when the crowd effect is not building price momentum into the market, 
you, you kind of have to say, okay, fundamentally, we know these things are valuable, but they're not, you know, there isn't enough excitement right now for these assets to grow uh, the way that we expect them to. So I'm changing some of my investment thesis to look at the, the overall market, especially the altcoins as more of a uh, crowd effect. And with crowd effect, you know, I mean, trend followers, you know, go to the front of the line, get out your, you know, your charts and, and your, your lines and funny colored patterns and everything else. Um, because what we're really starting to do is understand where's the crowd hype. You know, this is, this is in many ways kind of a reflexivity um, because I think crowd hype is what's going to drive pricing going into this fall and winter period more than the fundamental analysis on these things because they're all so broad and so complex that for investors to try to understand which one of these is going to be fundamentally more important than the others is a tremendously difficult challenge. However, for investors to say which one of these has the most upward momentum right now, that's a very simple visual or mathematical equation that any investor can do. So I think right now the more useful tools are going to be in the crowd hype and in the momentum space. Interesting. Has this caused you to – sounds like you're changing your outlook a little bit. Has this caused you to change your positioning overall in ETH? Have you decided to go more into it or perhaps maybe, as you mentioned, perhaps instead investigate some of these more – direct layer two opportunities? Yeah, we're, we're moving further down the asset allocation space into things that have uh, smaller market caps. You know, we're seeing such stability and maturity in Bitcoin and Ethereum and their ability to both act together, uh, but to also be a reservoir of value for the rest of the economy. So you look at things like Solana, Polkadot, uh, Uniswap, Luna, Litecoin. Uh, I think it's kind of fallen out of the running in many ways, but Matic, Link, some of these other projects, they have such tremendous upside. Uh, when they are at, you know, $10 billion market caps. Um, and the, the capacity from the price very quickly is very attractive. So obviously at Vellum Capital, we are an investment fund that runs a basket and we have a lot of risk controls in place. So no, we don't go 80% in on, on Shiba Inu or one of these crazy things. However, we do have a portion of the overall portfolio that we allocate to more aggressive style positions. And we monitor these very closely and aggressively. Um, but when there is upside momentum, we aim to capture that because these are more likely than not going to grow faster than Bitcoin and Ethereum in the near term. You heard it here first. Vellum 100% in on Shiba Inu <laughs> here. So uh, notify his investors <laughs> for him as we keep on rolling. Let's see what's going on from an overall ETH perspective out here. Uh, something similar from a vol perspective playing out in ETH to what we saw in Bitcoin on our last show, we had about a 91%. Uh, of course, we spiked last Friday up to about 105. So similar levels to Bitcoin out there and coming back off a little bit back into the 90s, if ever so slightly, right? About a 99% coming into the start of the show. Uh, skew, similar deal out there. About It was about a positive 0.5 on our last show. It spiked to almost a full five back on Friday, about 4.8. And it's back down now to about a positive two and a half. Uh, OI continuing to grow out there in ETH options, nearly a million, 916,000 contracts open on the call front out there. That's up 80,000 from this time last week. The puts, again, similar deal to Bitcoin, roughly two to one calls over puts out there in ETH as well. The puts at exactly 400K right now. It's up about 32,000 contracts from this past week. In terms of the notional value, again, similar story to Bitcoin, up a bit. It was $4 billion on Deribit last week, this week coming into today's show is at about five billion. Volume wise, we saw some nice numbers, but again, nowhere near the the record or near record levels we saw out there in Bitcoin. Remember, we have seen one billion multiple times out there in ETH. We haven't seen that over the course of this past week. The most active things got was about half that, about five hundred twenty five million on the sixteenth, half a billion. So about half of the levels we've seen in previous active days. It was sustained. We saw a few days of that last week, but nowhere near the, the highs we saw from a notional volume perspective that we saw out there in Bitcoin. Looking at where you folks are lining up from a monthly perspective, where your, where your trades are lining up from an expiration perspective. December, again, it remains the quarterlies having a firm grip on these positions, particularly in ETH. 513,000 contracts opened in December and ETH's up about 14,000 from this time last week. Number two is October with about 235,000 contracts, up about 30,000. From this time last week. And number three is March with about 207,000 contracts open. It's up about 27,000 contracts in this time last week. In terms of the size positions, where are you folks lining up from a strike perspective out there? 
similar to Bitcoin as well. Bitcoin, the big dog, is the par strike in ETH. It has been for some time the 5,000 strike, and that remains the case this week as well. 96,000 contracts open on the 5K strikes, up about 20,000 from this time last week. That's a big jump. Number two is the 10,000 strike. So if 5,000 isn't quite optimistic enough for you, the 10,000 strike is there with 68,000 contracts at number two. It's up about 8,000 from this time last week. Number three, the 4K strike. So kind of hovering to the at the money or in the money, depending on where we are on a particular day. That has about 56,000 contracts open. That's actually unched, which is surprising. That hasn't really seen a big change since this time last week. Number four, a newcomer. So <laughs> if the 5K and the 10K strikes weren't, weren't interesting enough for your blood out there, allow me to offer you the 15,000 strike, a newcomer to our top five at number four with 55,000 contracts open up there. There's a lot of size open on these far out of the money strikes. And number five, the comparatively rational and reasonable 6,000 strike with 52,000 contracts up about 5,000 from this time last week. In terms of the futures, we're just talking about the CME products over there. Obviously, a lot of focus on those this week. Uh, Not as much of a focus on the ETH futures over there at CME, and that's reflected in the numbers. The OI is actually down from this time last week. It's down to about exactly 4,000. That puts it down about 600 contracts from this time last week. And we saw them put up about exactly uh, 4,000 contracts out there as well uh, this time last week. So, you know, uh, interesting stuff out there across the board, but not as much paper going up in the world of ETH. Uh, Eric, any of this surprise you? Either the options numbers, the vol, the skew, the overall size positioning out there, or perhaps the fact that, you know, the ETH future is doing all right over there at CME, but not blowing any doors off yet. No, it makes sense to me. You know, the ETH ecosystem has a lot of things going on and it's a very exciting thing for people who've been in the crypto space for for a long time Um, but the availability of uh, active traders to participate in things like derivatives on ETH whether it's staking and renting out their coins or or just there's all sorts of different things going on so there's a huge menu of choices there's no limit of ways to either use leverage or or, um, interest in time and other features that are unique uh, to ETH that Bitcoin uh, don't really have developed for it. So the fact that they're not going to uh, traditional market vehicles is, is no surprise. Whether they eventually do or not, we'll, we'll really say a lot about the ability of the crypto space to develop these new ideas. Let's look really quickly at some of the other altcoin that are lighting up your tape before we get to some more of your questions and wrap things up. Ripple taking a bit of a break since our last show off about six cents and a good old doge a little bit of a lift up about two and a half cents since our last show in terms of other products out there we've seen uh cardano kind of unched off about a nickel from this time last week polka dot get a nice little lift up about six and a half uh, handles and solana back up nearly 12 handles so getting back some of that juice that it gave up in the previous week out there and of course a good old litecoin at about almost 180, 179 out there, up about nearly five handles since our last show. Had has had an interesting trajectory since that big pump and dump that came out about them. But it seems like it got Litecoin back on a lot of people's radar. Maybe had forgotten about it. So interesting stuff afoot out there as well. Let's see if your questions are interesting. You already got to some of them. We'll see if the rest are good as well. It is time to answer your crypto questions. You've got questions about crypto. Who doesn't? It's time to find out the answers to your crypto questions. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crypto questions. Before I get to those, let me pay off really quickly. Uh, the flash poll. We still have a few minutes left on this. But we're coming up to the end of the show here. We asked you, do you plan to trade the new ETF? Quite simply, yes, no, or you're not sure yet. It's, it's gotten more heated than I, I thought. It's pretty contentious out there. I thought it might be biased in one direction or the other but coming into the end of the show here we have 50 percent saying yes 40 percent saying no and 10 percent saying they're not sure yet if you haven't voted get in there quickly it's going the way of the dodo soon uh speaking of this etf everyone's got it on the brain these days eric uh fft wants to know he says i don't want to trade the cme futures is there any chance of a non-futures denominated bitcoin etf launching this year this is kind of the question everyone has on the brain these days eric so what are your thoughts on this and the chances for the the quote-unquote pure play etf coming out sometime this year sir 
So, so an ETF, an electronically traded fund, has to be is by its nature a regulated fund, and it has to settle to something. Um, and I mean, you could have an ETF in 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 you know soybeans or, or whatever you wanted to have. If you could show regulators that at the end of the day, when you have to settle, you can count up the number of beans you have, and there's a legitimate exercise that does uh, some verification. And until the regulators have made pronouncements on most of these crypto assets, I my general vote is no, there's not going to be a fund that directly holds the, the underlying assets. Um, right now, the regulator, regulators in the regulatory space are spending a lot of time looking at the stability coins. I know a fine was just put out to Tether recently. Um, you know, stability coins are... A, a very curious thing for why they even exist. I can see the market mechanism and the reason for having them. They don't really have an economic uh, reason for existing other than than as a offset, a uh, risk offset. Um, depending on how those eventually are treated, and if the SEC determines that a number of the altcoins or tier two projects are in fact um, equities or some other regulated uh, tradable, then I think we'll have a very different outlook on what can be thrown into an ETF or not. But it, as we are right now, I'd say there's very close to a 0% chance of having a direct uh, Bitcoin ETF by the end of the year. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to agree. There's a reason why the futures ETF went first, and it seems like it has the at least implied approval of the SEC. We'll see for sure. Later on tonight, because these are regulated products that they have some say over. CME has been around forever. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. They're right down the street here. You can go talk to them and find them here in the U.S. if you need to. There's, there's a lot of reasons why a lit and listed product would pave the way for the first Bitcoin ETF. It's going to be a while until I think the SEC, as you mentioned, Eric, has enough insight and enough perhaps oversight into some of these other venues and the other volume going up where they feel comfortable approving a quote-unquote pure play ETF. So that's what you're holding out hope for. It's probably going to be a little while longer. In the meantime, we got the futures one. At least we think we do. We'll see tomorrow and we'll know for sure by the time that our next show rolls around next week. All right, everybody. That music means we've come to the end of another epic journey. It was a fun one this week. A lot to talk about, including obviously the big dog out there, the impending launch of the Bitcoin ETF. You going to trade it? Let us know that yeah, that poll is going to go way the dodo pretty soon. But hit us up on all the various platforms out there. Let us know your thoughts. You haven't been reticent in the past. I don't expect you to be reticent on this topic either. Are you still holding out hope for the quote unquote pure play product? Are you trading something else? You're over Bitcoin. Hit us up. Let us know out there. And Eric, if the folks are interested in what you guys are up to over there at Vellum Capital, perhaps they want to learn more. Where should they go? What should they do? Yep, visit us at www.vellum.capital or send us an email at info at vellum.capital, C-A-P-I-T-A-L, and we'll write you back right away and be glad to talk to you. There you go. Vellum Capital is the place to go. That's two L's, V-E-L-L-U-M, capital out there. And of course, you know where to go to learn more about all these analytics we're talking about on the show today. Perhaps do your own research, your own analysis. Gval.io is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires. You can see all this data for yourselves over there. And of course, we'll see you back here throughout the rest of the week. We've got a great pro Q&A coming up with the one and only Mr. Tony Saliba tomorrow for all of you out there in the secret club. If you haven't joined up yet, the options insider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more about that. Of course, Wednesday for a lot of you out there who are newer to the world of derivatives, options, boot camp, options, playbook radio, two great educational shows coming at you every Wednesday here on the network Thursday, this week in futures options, another show on the network where we get into the world of crypto. Check that one out. If you haven't done so already, of course, episode two of the option block Friday volatility views. And for all of you secret club members, you get options oddities as well. Then we're back again next Monday with another episode of the crypto rundown. This program is brought to you by Genesis Volatility, also known as GVOL, home of institutional grade crypto options analytics. Whether you're trading CFI options or DeFi options, cryptocurrencies move. Use GVOL analytics to analyze implied volatility, model realized volatility, structure positions, and unlock alpha. For more information, visit GVOL.io. That's G V O L.io.
You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.